What a great time to talk about uh, gigantic crypto collapses. Perfect. Hope not many of you have got too much money in FTX. I'm sorry if you do. Because I want to talk about this woman. And what I'm going to do is tell you the story and then just really give you one lesson, I suppose, one or two little lessons that might be relevant for you. Have any of you seen this woman, by the way? The, you, if you have, if you have, Dr. Ruja Ignatova, the founder of OneCoin, you could go to the FBI and claim your $100,000 reward for information leading to her arrest. You could probably go to Netflix, actually, and pick up about a million dollars for uh, the exclusive interview. Or you could come to the BBC and speak to me, where you'll earn my eternal gratitude, which I know is worth more <laughs> than either of those things. Because for the last four years, we have been looking for Dr. Ruja Ignatova. Um, the founder of OneCoin, probably, until recently, perhaps the biggest crypto scam of all time. Let me give you the brief outline of what she actually did. 2014, think back, cryptocurrency, quite nascent, quite new. She turns up and says, Bitcoin is uh, for criminals. It's for anarchists, it's for darknet drug dealers. You don't want to go there. And anyway, it's very expensive. But I've got a better version of Bitcoin that I've created. It's called OneCoin. It's, it's really for everyday people. Um, so if you think, if you lose your, if you, if Bitcoin is a decentralized blockchain hosted on multiple computers. It's irreversible. Transactions can't be reversed if anything's hacked. My blockchain is centralized and controlled by me. So <laughs> if uh, you do lose your Bitcoin, just give us a call at HQ in Sofia, Bulgaria, and I'll send it back to you. <laughs> now that sounds ridiculous, but for ordinary people, who were the target of this, that actually makes a bit more sense. Because she wasn't aiming her one coin at, no offense guys, people in this room, <laughs> she was aiming it at people that had no idea really about technology, which is 95% of the population. She also said, this might suddenly ring a few alarm bells for you. You remember Avon, Amway, Tupperware, Herbalife, <laughs> multi-level marketing companies, yeah, we're actually going to sell one coin through multi-level marketing. And my mum was an Avon lady, so I remember how it worked. Recruit a few friends to your house to have a little drink, sell them some perfume, make 10%, then get them to sell it to their friends, make 1% from that, and so on and so on, creating a gigantic pyramid. She said, you're going to make loads of money doing this. One coin is now so cheap, and it's going to go the same as Bitcoin. So you've got to get in early. Um, you can't turn it back into real money just yet, but you will be able to in a few weeks or a few months. Okay, that's basically the pitch. And suddenly this thing spreads like wildfire. 2016, she's talking on stage, Wembley Arena, 3,000 cheering fans. Back, I'll give you a tiny sample. I believe that OneCoin is really the only cryptocurrency out there thinking in a global, global and holistic way, way Look at that. about yeah. how to make the coin usable out there. I don't know any cryptocurrency doing this. Yeah, right. So she's out there, she is, and this thing is being pushed all around the world, 175 countries, a, a million investors who'd invested 4 billion euros, and it's being sold by people like this. I don't know if this looks like a normal crypto in specialist to you. This guy was selling Organigold coffee before he joined the crypto. He became a crypto specialist. Anyone who's listened to the podcast, this is Igor Alberts, the Dutch guy who was making a million dollars a month selling one coin because he never talked about technology on stage. He never talked about hash rates or mining. He just said things like this. But that actually worked. Anyway, October 2017, Dr. Ruja realizes that the authorities are onto her. It's a very, very grand story how this actually unfolded that I won't go into. But she suddenly boards a Ryanair flight. No one would suspect it. From Sofia, Bulgaria to Athens, Greece, and disappears into thin air. The price of one coin, which had been going up week by week by week, to the point at which those one million people thought they held collectively 200 billion euros worth of one coin was entirely fabricated by her. She had no real blockchain. She basically had an SQL database, but the missing SQL database queen didn't really have the same ring as the missing crypto queen, so we called it the missing crypto queen. 
And she essentially convinced a million people to invest 4 billion euros in an SQL database. I mean, you've got to hand it to her, that's pretty smart. This wasn't really ever about technology. It wasn't really about the technology. Or it was, but it was convincing ordinary people that this amazing, hyped up, brilliant new thing was the future. Don't worry about the details though, just trust me. To show you how she did this, I'm going to give you a couple of little uh, lessons, how so many people fell for it. This is actually her CV. Dr. Ruja Ignatova is a very, very impressive woman. I mean, for one thing, she had a degree from Oxford University, and who has ever lied to you from Oxford University? <laughs> no one. She was a PhD in comparative law, five years at McKinsey's, and she was saying to people, ordinary investors, remember, don't worry about the tech. It is too complicated, but look at my credentials. And if you don't believe me, how about this? She used to use what's called essentially affinity fraud. Be near to very established, trustworthy brands, and some of it will rub off on me. She'd have sponsored content in uh, trade magazines. There you go, she's on the front cover of Forbes magazine. Incredible, except that this was not the front cover of Forbes magazine. This was actually sponsored content on page two of Forbes Bulgaria magazine. She had thousands of them printed off, ripped off the real cover, and then sent that around the world to investors who thought, wow, I don't care about hash rates. She's on the front cover of Forbes. She did the same thing speaking at an Economist event. And this isn't fake. This is a real event where she was the, where she was the platinum sponsor. Be careful who you sponsor, guys because she was speaking at The Economist about crypto, and I spoke to many, many investors who said, again, didn't understand any of it, but I saw The Economist brand next to her, and I guessed someone must have checked. Someone must be checking this. This is far more powerful than technology white papers for ordinary investors. But the real thing she did, and I suppose this is the hack, She's hacking psychology, really, rather than technology. That's the key to all of this. She was uh, essentially playing on people's fear of missing out. That's what it all came down to. People had seen their friends, their relatives getting rich on Bitcoin. They'd seen everyone know someone, you all know someone, who invested in Bitcoin in 2012 and now drives around in a Lamborghini, and it doesn't seem fair. And she would say to people, this is, where Bitcoin, this is where one coin is going. This is the price of one coin in the future. Now, actually, anyone who looked would see the price of one coin, determined by demand and supply, she said, actually look like this. I don't know whether you're familiar with demand and supply graphs. I mean, generally, they don't look like that. People didn't care. People didn't care. Because they were so overwhelmed by the fear of missing out that all their normal critical faculties were just completely overwhelmed. And smart people, very clever people, fell for this. There were red flags absolutely everywhere, but it didn't matter. When people would say to OneCoin investors, be careful, because if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Warren Buffett can get you 10% a year. Dr. Rouge is promising 300% immediately. Uh, it's not possible. And they would say, yeah, but what about Bitcoin? Happened, didn't it? And this is the problem, really, with all new technology. Uh, people turn up, people are excited, things get hyped up, and then ordinary people turn up, and they have their psychology hacked, rather than just their technology hacked. So let me tell you what I think this sort of all means. How am I doing for time? I can see you're getting, you've been getting worried, but I feel like I'm still green. Carry on. How Carry long on. have I got left? About five minutes. Yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so what, what I think all of this means. Well, the first thing is the, uh, the, the utter incredible professionalism of these people. I cannot express, I've, I've studied the dark net an awful lot. I've now spent three to four years looking for these people. Online criminals, and she really is one of the biggest cyber criminals of all time. Yeah, she's not writing clever code. But she's one of the biggest cyber criminals of all time. Unbelievably professional, unbelievably talented, adaptive. She is probably right now thinking about, oh, I wonder, fascinating speech by Nina Schick there about deep fakes. 
I wonder if I could maybe do a few deep, maybe I could get a few more deep fake versions of me talking at The Economist again. That would be great, and I'll sell some NFTs this time instead, <laughs> because they're really exciting and hyped up. Darknet markets are the same. They're becoming democratized, they're becoming easier to use. All of the technology, whether it's the deep fakes you heard from Nina, or all the various um, plug in and play ransomware stuff, it's all heading in the same direction, which is democratizing access to it. The reason so many people could invest in one coin was because access to financial services like this was also democratized. Anyone from anywhere in the world could suddenly invest in a crypto asset something that would have been very, very hard to do five years earlier. And she was able to target people from Sofia in small villages in Uganda. I went to one. Everyone in this tiny village, 400 kilometers west of Kampala, knew Dr. Ruja. Many of them had invested their money in one coin. And the regulators, the lawmakers, are so slow that they might figure this out after two years by which point a billion euros has already been invested and it's too late. So we're not fast enough. The other thing is, um, is really the, the, the execution of this. What is it that she really managed to do? How she really managed to pull this off? Um, uh, uh, everything about this was really psychology. It wasn't really about technology at all. She was trying to hack into people's cognitive weakness, people's cognitive bias. And I think when I think about cybersecurity generally and cyber defense generally, many of you all know that the hardest thing is to convince staff to do the basics well, to, to just not click on the silly links, to make sure the passwords are arranged properly. The really, really basic things. Now, I have very, very good friends of mine, and they know the work that I do, who phone me up sometimes and say things like, oh my God, I've got such, I had such a great day. Uh, I got a text message from HMRC saying, <laughs> I'm owed a tax rebate. It's brilliant, I filled it in, it's supposed to be coming tomorrow. And it's almost as if, as they're explaining it to me, they're realizing what they've done. <laughs> and when it came to OneCoin, people with a PhD in finance PhD in economics had invested in a very, very obvious Ponzi scheme because the technology obscured it. People thought this was amazing, fantastic, but it really was just an old-fashioned Ponzi scheme and they put crypto around the top of it and everyone was baffled. Everyone thought it was exciting and different because she's playing on that cognitive weakness, the desire that people have for things to be true. I spoke to Frank Schneider a man who is her, was her security chief, the head of SREL in Luxembourg. He was a di director of ops at SREL in Luxembourg, intelligence agency, became a head of security, currently facing extradition to the US. I interviewed him. He had an under house arrest with an ankle bracelet on. I said, Frank, you're a spy. Did you not suspect anything? Oh, I don't understand blockchain. It's really complicated. I said, so when Dr. Ruja went on stage at London Wembley Arena, I didn't tell you this bit. She said, and she told the crowd that she was going to build a new blockchain that was going to increase the supply of one coin by a factor of 50, but that the price was going to remain constant. Did that not ring any alarm bells? That's economics 101. He said, no, but I didn't understand the technology. It's just an excuse. It's just an excuse. So what I really try to encourage with this, and it is the big lesson, is to think psychology. Uh, people want to believe things, and when they want to believe things, they will believe them. They, people with PhDs in finance who would say, I've studied Bernie Madoff, I understand Ponzi schemes, this is not a Ponzi scheme, are more likely to be baffled in many respects because they think they won't be. So the more you can focus on that lesson, that it's about psychology, they try to make you rush, they try to make you click on things quickly because this, they're saying that the CEO wants this invoice signed off by 5 p.m. on Friday and you're panicked. That's the sign to look out for when they're trying to hack your psychology. And when you see the rise of deep fake synthetic you know, voice generated AI, so even phone calls to the CEO to sign off on an invoice are going to be fakeable, 
It's going to be even more about hacking your psychology than ever. And I would encourage people to be very honest and open about that because that is always going to be the best way that we can learn. When I tell people that me too, I suffer from fear of missing out. I too have made these mistakes. A doctor in the US has gone public and said, I invested, uh, I mean, a really top surgeon in the US invested $900,000 in this scheme. And it makes people not feel so stupid. That, okay, yeah, maybe I could also have fallen for that. Need to be more careful. Mm -hmm. That's the one lesson I want to impart. Psychology, not just technology. And just my final slide, um, just in case you do see her, just want to quickly put that up there. Probably when you're on holiday next year, Greece, Mediterranean, islands, fancy hotels and bars. She looks five years older now. It's been a tough five years, so probably more. Blonde hair, quite different, but just keep your eyes open. And remember, come to the BBC first and then to the FBI and Netflix. Thank you all very much Jamie, for listening. Jamie, brilliant.